Well, I have 530, so let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to convene this meeting of the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District for December 1st, 2022. Um, can you call the roll, please, Holly? President Mayhood. Here. Vice President Ackerman. I'm here. Um, if I have a minute, I might shut down my computer and try and restart to get my video to work, but I'll be here without video either way. Okay. Director Falls. Here. Director Hill. Here. Director Smalley. Here. Okay. Are there any additions or deletions to the closed session agenda? Uh, staff has none. Okay. I, I would just like to uh, talk about, because we've got four different items on the agenda for the closed session, and we're going to reverse the order of um, the D and C. And um, depending on how we're doing in terms of time for closed session, we may need to reconvene um, after the meeting. And my intention would be to break um, before C, if if that is necessary. Okay. Um, so uh, this is the time for oral communications regarding items that are um, in the closed session. And I don't see any attendees out there. Is that correct, Holly? That are... You're muted. Yeah, you're muted. I, I can't see any. So I think um, with that, Agreed. we can adjourn to closed session. Um, so then I would like to uh, reconvene the open session. Um, can we have a roll call, Holly? President Mayhood. Here. Vice President Ackman. Here. Director Fultz. Here. Director Hill. Here. Director Smalley. Here. Okay. Um, there were no actions taken in closed session. Are there any additions or deletions to the agenda for tonight? There are no changes to the agenda, Chair. Okay. Um, this is the time for oral communications uh, from members of the public. And let's see, we do have a few attendees out there. Um, would anybody like to address the board on any items uh, within the purview of the district, but they're not on the agenda tonight? I don't see any hands up. Um, so with that, we'll go to the president's report and which there is none. <laughs> and uh, then to unfinished business, which is our uh, Ever beloved remote meeting authorization under AB 361. So we need somebody to uh, move uh, that resolution. And Chair, just a reminder to take public comment, even though that may not be likely. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Well, I was going, well, we could take it. All right. Are there any comments on this from the public? How about from the board? Okay, can I have a motion then? I'll motion that we um, approve the resolution to continue the remote meeting authorizations under um, AB 361. All second. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Passed unanimously. On to uh, new business. And the first is um, a Santa Margarita groundwater sustainability plan. And I'll, uh, we're, we have some visitors tonight that are gonna give us a, a presentation. Hi, Tim. Um, and uh, so I'll let uh, Rick go ahead and introduce this topic. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, uh, this item, uh, item is the Department of Water Resources uh, Sustainable Groundwater Management Implementation Round 2 Grant Solicitation for Projects 
it's a resolution and a representative uh, authorization. Uh, we, our recommendation is for the board to review the memo and adopt the attached resolution that will allow the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency to apply for grant funding for district projects. To present this item tonight to the board, we have uh, Tim Carson and Rob Swartz from uh, the Regional Water Management Foundation. And with that, I will turn that over to Tim and Rob. Let me just... Uh... Because the board may not realize the uh, Regional Water Foundation is the group that sort of uh, handles and administers the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency. Um, Tim is the first the honcho of all of that, and it also involves uh, mid, uh, mid county. Yeah, Bob, is there? I just, had a, I just had a clarification. Uh, are these grants for district um, projects or for Santa yeah, Margarita Yes, and, and that's why we're, we've asked Tim and Rob to uh, come. They, they are, as you'll see if you read at the end of the resolution. And I asked um, Rob and Tim to come and uh, sort of provide some context for um, this. I mean, it's been dealt with extensively at Santa Margarita, but I wanted them to come and talk about it. Um, and our job here is basically to listen to that. And what we're essentially doing is uh, giving a letter of support to the activities of Santa Margarita um, and agreeing to those projects that would be paid for by the state that are um, those projects that our staff has advanced for our district. I'm 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 a little confused about how all that works. Maybe we can cover well, that, it. After that's the why Tim and that's why Tim and Robert yeah. is to speak to speak to us. But I just wanted you to to, to know that Tim, um, it, and he sort of is the one that handles the administration of the meetings, and um, uh, so he's taken over from Perrette Harmon in some of those aspects of Santa Margarita. And then Rob recently joined um, as the planner and has had a very large role in helping uh, write the grant and his uh, experience um, at the state level in terms of knowing how to get grants uh, through and how you structure them to take advantage of the things that the state wants to hear, I think has been really important, um, at least that as, as I've understood it, as. Um, been described by our staff. So I'll I'll go ahead and turn it over to you guys now. Okay, good evening everyone. Thank you very much for the introductions and, and for the opportunity to present tonight. As mentioned, uh, my name is Tim Carson. I'm the program director at the Regional Water Management Foundation. And as Chair Mehud indicated, um, the Regional Water Management Foundation is providing planning and administrative support to the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency. We have had a similar role for the Santa Cruz Mid-County Groundwater Agency since 2016, but it's only recently, as of uh, July 1st, that we have assumed that role uh, on behalf of Santa Margarita. And so that is through a joint contract uh, between both of those agencies and the County of Santa Cruz. And so um, in the time that we have been supporting Santa Margarita, um, a main focus of activity over the last several months is to, has been to look at this grant opportunity. And so to work with staff at the district, work with Rick and Carly, as well as staff from the other agencies that are participating in the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency and try to um, evaluate and put together a suite of projects and management actions that we think will be competitive for this implementation funding opportunity. So what we're gonna do this evening is I'm gonna start and give a, an overview of the grant opportunity and um, what the state is looking for in terms of um, the scoring criteria. And then I'm gonna hand it over to uh, my colleague, Rob, who's gonna go into more detail in terms of um, what the process to date has entailed and what the status of the application is in terms of the current activities and, um, and the makeup of the components and the amounts. And just by way of additional background information, so we did um, present a similar presentation, although in greater detail to the Santa Margarita Board at its October meeting. Um, However, we've, uh, we've advanced since then. And so what we're bringing back tonight um, is some additional detail on what those components look like, 
and some additional detail on um, on the dollar amounts associated with each of those. So um, feel free to stop us along the way and ask questions. Um, but like I said, I'll start and then I'll hand it over to Rob. So I'm gonna share my screen here. Okay, hopefully we're seeing that all right. Great, okay, so some of the basics. Um, this grant opportunity is through the Department of Water Resources Sustainable Groundwater Management Implementation Grant Program. This is round two. Round one was limited to critically overdrafted basins. So Santa Margarita was not eligible for that round. There is approximately $200 million available and there's quite a range on the potential ask, anywhere from 1 million up to uh, 20 million is the maximum award. However, um, with only $200 million available and potentially um, 90 basins eligible, that has really factored into um, what we think is going to um, be a competitive ask within that overall, what we expect to be very competitive funding round. One of the big um, benefits of this round is that there is no local cost share required. So often under the recent state grants, particularly under proposition one through that bond, it was a 50-50 match. Um, and unlike that, um, there is no local cost share that is uh, required. The activity period, um, goes back to the release of this solicitation. So as of October 4th, um, eligible activities may be reimbursed if the, MG, if the agency, if the GSA is successful in the award, and it will cover activities through April 30th of 2026. And so that has been another um, consideration as we've evaluated the projects and management actions within the groundwater sustainability plan in terms of, okay, what is feasible to do within that um, eligibility timeline. So I mentioned the solicitation itself opened uh, October 4th and it closes in a couple of weeks. So it's a um, has been a relatively busy time period um, since then trying to pull the proposal together. We have known that this um, was coming and so all of the agencies that are participating as part of Santa Margarita had been evaluating um, earlier in the year, sort of putting together, um, pulling from the projects and management actions identified in the groundwater sustainability plan, what they thought may be um, good fits for this funding opportunity. But really we needed to see the specific criteria within the Department of Water Resources proposal solicitation package and their scoring criteria to do that detailed evaluation of what seemed like it was gonna be the, the best fit for this funding round. It's a rather lengthy process. So um, the application will go in um, in December. The state is anticipated to make their draft awards in May, uh, post the final awards um, next summer, and it will be um, sometime a year from now or so before the uh, actual grant is executed. That said, once the agency um, has the green light in terms of the final award, um, that eligibility period of October 4th, any activities conducted since then ultimately can be eligible for reimbursement. So that's what the overall um, funding availability looks like and the timeline looks like. Um, next, I wanted to talk a little bit about the scoring criteria and the application itself. So there are 28 points total that we are working towards. The way the state divides them up, you can see the, the maximum points possible shown in that um, right-hand scoring column there. So in terms of a project description, they're really looking at how well have you supported the activities or components? Components is the phrase we're gonna use because that's the terminology that the state is using. The entire application itself is going in as a single project in their terminology. The project can consist of discrete components. 
each of the components will be scored against the criteria that I'm about to go through. So on that first one, they use the term project, but in actuality, we're looking at, okay, it has the, um, has the agency provided an adequate um, description in terms of the work that's gonna be um, provided? Have we um, discussed why it was selected, um, who it's benefiting, uh, things like measurable objectives and minimal thresholds? These are things that are elements of the groundwater sustainability plan itself. It would like, there, there, is, there needs to be in order to be eligible, uh, the activities must be a part of the groundwater sustainability plan itself. And so the state is very much looking for that linkage to what has been approved already within that groundwater sustainability plan. In terms of the project benefits, they're looking at how well, how strong is the explanation of the quantitative benefits um, that are being um, that are being stated, you know, how will those be evaluated and how will they be quantified? So the sort of supporting level of detail, um, the better job that is done, or the more fully those are addressed, um, then the more likely that score will be a four and it drops down accordingly from there. Map is fairly straightforward, you know, it has a map been provided of the region and the work that's going to be done, the project specifically. And then we shift into um, these ones that are uh, bolded and italicized here. And these are the points um, that we think are going to be more challenging for um, Santa Margarita to achieve. And that first one is looking at the benefits to underrepresented communities. And so um, what that means in this context, underrepresented communities, refers to economically disadvantaged communities or severely economically disadvantaged communities. Those are based upon the census data and the median household income. The state provides a mapping tool to help assist in identifying those um, within the region. And I'll, I'll highlight that in a moment. And then um, some other potential categories. So are there any um, tribes or tribal lands in the basin? There are not in this case. Um, or are there any other um, environmental health metrics that can be identified through another statewide screening tool, something called the Cal Enviro screen. And so at this point, and I'll, I'll get into the details on the map tool right in just a minute to give you an idea of what things are looking at right now, but that's part of what we have been assessing. In order to fully score four points in that category, um, it must be benefiting um, either a tribe or a severely disadvantaged community. We don't have those in the Santa Margarita Basin, so we know we're not going to achieve full points on that score, um, but we do meet some of the other um, criteria, and so we're, we're aiming at partial points there. One of the overall bigger picture um, items that we are keeping an eye on is we know that we're competing statewide against the other high and, might and medium priority basins. Um, some of those basins are in areas of the state that um, are going to have the potential to score the maximum points in some of these categories. And so it becomes very important for us to um, be strategic and trying to maximize the points in those categories, particularly the ones I mentioned earlier, the description, the benefits, um, some of the ones that we'll talk about down, further down the list, scope of work of really trying to um, achieve the full points in those categories in order to be competitive. The next one looks at benefits to small systems and domestic wells. And I'm gonna blow up this map again in a second, just so we can take a look at sort of what that looks like within um, the outline of the Santa Margarita Basin. And then the next one looks at human right to water. And so back in 2012, um, California passed the human right to water policy. This states that um, it is a human right for, um, for all human beings to have access to safe, affordable and accessible water um, for drinking, for cooking and for sanitation purposes. And so what has become um, standard within many of the state's grants is to look at are the projects that are receiving state grant funding, helping the state to achieve this objective. And so again, Rob will talk a bit more about sort of how we've looked at projects in part um, 
to try to address some of those issues. Again, with an eye towards really trying to maximize the score, knowing this is going to be a competitive funding round. The next one gets at the scope of work itself. So, how well have we um, supported um, and detailed the tasks that are going to be done under each of these proposed components? And then um, just a couple of points for the budget and schedule themselves, mainly, um, you know, are they reasonably supported? Are they aligning with the way the rest of the proposal uh, is presented in terms of the scope and work, scope of work um, and schedule? And so with that, I'm gonna blow this up and relocate this map a little bit just to give you a sense of what we're talking about when um, <clears throat> for example, on that disadvantaged community um, tool. So uh, just a second. So it's, it may be a little bit um, difficult to see here, but um, on this map, it in this brown hashed area calls out what qualifies. In, this is at the census block group level as an economically disadvantaged area. We're looking at the, the sort of larger triangle, right, is the overall boundary of the Santa Margarita groundwater basin. There is this area through here that qualifies as an economically disadvantaged community within that. We do have um, the dots here are represented the um, location of um, private residential wells. Um, and so, um, uh, so not a huge area, but it is present. Um, we also, uh, the map indicates where small water systems are located as well. So as some of the projects and management actions within the groundwater sustainability plan are being evaluated, we're definitely taken to, into consideration, okay, um, how do those fit within the context of the state scoring criteria on this grant? How is the work that's being proposed going to um, provide benefits to those communities? So that's, that is sort of what the overall um, Funding availability, timeline, and scoring portion of it looks like. And at this point, um, I'm going to hand it over to Rob, and he can talk more in more detail about some of the considerations that um, the district and the other agencies um, have taken um, taken into account in putting the application together. Um, and it also gives me an opportunity to um, introduce Rob. I appreciate um, Chair Mahoud um, gave a bit of an introduction as well, but Rob is a relatively um, new addition to our team. So when we expanded from supporting Mid County to Santa Margarita as well, um, we had heard from the agencies about the need to bring on a senior planner. Uh, we previously had somebody in this capacity when we were working to develop the GSP in the Mid County. Um, but with the work that is now anticipated as we're shifting into the implementation phase in, um, in both of the GSAs, um, and the grant funding opportunities that we knew were, be, were going to become available, it was very clear that it was to the benefit of the agencies to bring on somebody in a full-time capacity. He is essentially 50-50 split between the two GSAs to um, help move those planning efforts along. And so, um, as mentioned, Rob brings a lot of experience from his prior work um, with the uh, Regional Water Authority and the Sacramento Groundwater Authority, working on um, groundwater management and planning, working on integrated regional water management planning, and um, brings a background, technical background, both as a professional geologist and certified um, hydrogeologist. And so um, it's, been, it's been great to have Rob working as part of the team, working with the district staff and with the other staff to um, really um, help us strategize on this funding opportunity. And so with that, um, let me switch the slide and I will um, hand it over to Rob. Great, thank you, Tim. Uh, I'll try to be brief. I know that you all have a long evening. I do appreciate your time. I'm happy to come back at any point in the future and talk about any of these topics uh, in much more detail. Uh, love to talk about groundwater management in particular. Uh, but tonight, I want to talk about some of the considerations that we had when we developed the application. First of all, Tim's already mentioned to you, we expect a lot of competition for funding. 
Uh, there are over 90 eligible basins. Uh, at the state workshop, there were over 160 participants. Uh, I'm aware specifically of a, a basin in Southern California that's looking at doing a purified wastewater project similar to Soquel Creek. Uh, they've already announced their intention to apply for $15 million. So there are some large projects that are gonna be coming through in some pretty high priority basins. And as Tim mentioned, a lot of these basins have very large disadvantaged communities. So when you look at the scoring criteria, um, it's very important to think about those, those factors. Next was actually feedback from DWR. So fortunately, after we had the Santa Margarita uh, board meeting, we were able to arrange a meeting with the DWR representative from the grant program. And we sort of shot by, around some of the ideas that we had and got some feedback from them. And I think it was generally well received. Uh, the next is really kind of focusing on projects that we can implement at a basin wide level. Because as Tim showed you, even with these individual domestic wells or some of these small water systems, they're all sort of just smattered around the basin. And if you focus on a project that's gonna have a very limited benefit to a small area, you may not be able to even attempt to uh, classify this as benefiting a disadvantaged community, the, the, the limited one that we have, uh, domestic well owners or small water systems. So our approach is to benefit the basin as a whole so that we're basically, you know, all boats float. Uh, so uh, that's another approach that we took as we identified the project components. Another consideration was offsetting existing cost commitments. So the GSP that was adopted just about a year ago now identified specific things that had to happen. They're required by the law, annual reporting, monitoring, items like that. So we did build in some costs into the grant to try to offset some of the commitments that you all have already made. And finally, uh, we really wanted to focus on moving implementation of projects and management actions that were identified in the plan forward. And I think that's been a discussion that some of you have heard. Um, one of the projects, so let me give you some examples. So when it comes to projects and, and groundwater management, to me, it's sort of a no-brainer. You need to focus on recharge, right? This groundwater basin is a reservoir system. And, and really the key is successful management of that is finding opportunities when you have wet periods uh, or available surface water or other supplies and getting them into the groundwater basin so they're available for us during these dry periods, just like we're experiencing today. So there are a lot of different forms of recharge, but I want to talk just quickly about four that are specifically mentioned in the groundwater sustainability plan. And the first, and it's always my favorite, is in lieu conjunctive use. So it's basically a fancy term for managing your groundwater and surface water to better align with the conditions. So when it's dry, you're gonna preferentially use groundwater. When it's wet, you're gonna preferentially use surface water. And, and, and SLV, pardon me if, if you don't refer to yourselves as SLV, I just, it just sort of flows out uh, from me. Uh, but your district is no stranger to this. You, you practice conjunctive use today. When you can, you get surface water in areas and let some of the wells rest. You are looking at expanding those through Loch Lomond. Uh, there are two phases that are identified in the groundwater sustainability plan. And to me, it's really my favorite method of achieving recharge. It's, it's simply, it's very efficient and it's one of the most cost-effective ways of achieving it as well. Another way that is described in the plan and was even evaluated to a degree is injecting purified wastewater. So again, you, you all likely heard about the pure water SoCal, so that's taking treated wastewater and really doing advanced treatment on it from there. You're doing micro, microfiltration you're doing reverse osmosis, and then you're doing ultraviolet light treatment on it. So this is very purified water um, that's being taken and it can be injected into the aquifer system. We're fortunate in this area that the Mid-County Basin is gonna be ahead of us. Um, they're already constructing projects right now and constructing wells. So some of the pilot testing that would really need to occur will be happening over the next couple of years. I will say that you know this is a sandstone aquifer system. It has its challenges. A lot of injection is much more common in alluvial aquifer systems. It's much more straightforward. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, largely untested. There are not a lot of really good examples of doing this in, in sandstone aquifer systems. Uh, but, we, but it is believed that it, it is at least part of the solution for managing the basin as a whole. Another way is injecting potable water. And this would be taking water that's just been treated to drinking water standards, moved through a distribution system and injected through a well, and in the future, it could be taken back from that same well. That's called an aquifer storage and recovery well or ASR well that many of you have probably heard of before. Another method is stormwater recharge. And that's essentially being done in Scotts Valley. 
um, to a degree. There have been what they call low impact development projects. So this is kind of a passive way of recharging. A lot of times what you do is condition development. So if it's gonna, if, if an area is gonna get developed uh, and that area traditionally was maybe allowing recharge to occur from rain falling on, on the ground and you're now paved it, paving it over, one of the mitigation measures is to basically offset uh, that loss of recharge. And, and basically you capture that water and you allow it to percolate into the aquifer system traditionally through something that we call a dry well. These are fairly shallow wells that allow some water just to come in from the surface and just eventually make its way into the system. These are pretty small volumes of water though, uh, much lower than any of the other methods that we see. But these are the four methods uh, that were described in the groundwater sustainability plan and different agencies are looking at implementing these at different degrees. So, I want to set the stage with that uh, so that we can talk of then about the next slide, Tim. So basically, I'll, I'll just cut to the chase and talk about the scope that we have put into the plan. So the state requires that you have grant administration as your first task or first component of a project. And that would be managing the grant itself, all the reporting requirements over the three plus years um, that we would, if successful, would be managing the grant. We budgeted $200,000 for that. I don't really think that requires a lot of discussion. The next item is component two is evaluate, prioritize, and refine GSP projects. And so that is really looking at the recharge opportunities that I just talked about. So individual agencies have different things that they were looking to do. And in the plan, uh, one of the implementation items is actually over the next five years to advance looking at these projects, advance the level of knowledge about them. So some of them require some additional design work, uh, some additional cost estimating, maybe environmental, to make sure that they're gonna be feasible. But ultimately we wanna look and say around the whole basin, what could we employ as a recharge method and where, right? So we know Scotts Valley is interested in looking at doing some of the advanced wastewater treatment uh, recharge. We know that San Lorenzo Valley is very interested in expanding the in lieu conjunctive use. So we know that there are different things at different parts of the system. Uh, and again, you know, even if you could do entirely in lieu conjunctive use, because it's a very complex geography, it'd be very challenging to get surface water all the way out to the furthest ends of the basin, furthest away, right? So you're always going to have to look at different means. And what this would do is ultimately advance the project knowledge and it would create what we call bundles. It would essentially look at what are some of the options that we could be uh, putting into a, a system and sort of optimizing those. So if you're gonna do, I'll use Scotts Valley as an example. They're interested in both ASR, a potable water, but they're also interested in, in injecting highly treated wastewater. Well, if you, if you do one, maybe you're gonna be taking up some of your system capacity to do the other, right? So you have limitations like that, or maybe one of them is very expensive, or more cost effective, and maybe you would rather start doing one today because it's more feasible to start it now, and, and through time, you would ultimately change that. So what we're looking to do is evaluate all these projects together as a whole through modeling and sort of optimize some solutions. And again, it's not going to come up with a single solution. It's going to come up with a series of solutions all of which that we believe would be feasible to implement at some point in the future. It will still be up to the individual agencies to decide whether or not they're going to construct them, how they would get funded and such. But this would really advance, um, as I said, sort of the state of knowledge of our projects and also come up with opportunities for us to start thinking about how do we start uh, you know, developing and funding on the ground projects that are going to help the basin out. So as part of that, San Lorenzo Valley has identified that they would like to do some more feasibility and cost estimating for the, the Loch Lomond expansion, conjunctive use, and some funding for the focused DS, EIR that you currently have underway. And again, as Tim mentioned, regardless of the fact that it's going to take eight plus months for us to find out the, the fate of this grant, uh, those costs would be eligible after October 4th. So we could potentially get reimbursement from that. And I want to ask, answer Director Fultz's question right now. Uh, Santa Margarita GSA would be the applicant for the state funding. You would be a partner ultimately in that if we were successful. And so basically these funds would be managed and reimbursed back out to the district on, on your behalf through the GSA award. So you're not the direct applicant. You would be considered a par project partner. 
So we have $350,000 budgeted for that activity. Uh, we would also then hire a consultant and we worked with KJ to help us, Kennedy Jenks, excuse me, to help us come up with a sort of a scope and, and what would we think it would take to facilitate all of these discussions to happen. So it would be all of the agencies that would be participating, talking about your projects, at what level you might want to implement them and when, and so that we could develop these, these what we call bundles, put them into the model and analyze them as a group. And so that would be this primary activity. And then what we, again, believe the end product then would be a suite of feasible projects. And as I said, sort of the where would they occur, right? So again, in some cases, Scotts Valley may have a stormwater recharge project that's gonna occur in some portion of the basin because the geology is more favorable to occur in that particular part of the basin. So we're budgeting $1.3 million for component two. The next is component three. And again, as I, it, it, sorry, back to component two, the focus is let's do it basin wide so that we can try to get as many points as we can on those very challenging criteria for us. Then component three, again, the approach is basin wide, uh, taking things like they've already been committed for and budgeted for surface water monitoring, annual reporting. Uh, we have a monitoring well in here that's been budgeted and I want to address that uh, briefly. In the groundwater sustainability plan, we identified the need for nine monitoring wells. The GSA received a Proposition 68 grant award, which was intended to construct those. And ultimately, partially due to time and inflation, uh, the, the funding through that program did not fund, could not fund all of those. It funded eight. And so that left this last deepest monitoring well, which is quite expensive because of going into the Batana formation. Uh, so we included that in this. And then we had other things like looking at what are potential long-term funding options. We know it's expensive to comply with Sigma. So what are the, what are the types of fees that other bases are using uh, and how are they collecting those? So there's an opportunity. And then finally in the groundwater sustainability plan, an extraction metering program for non-de minimis. And that's, again, non-de minimis is a fancy way for saying any potential groundwater user using more than two acre feet of water. So if you use more than two acre feet of water, you're considering non-de minimis extraction. Uh, for example, Mid-County is really, they're looking at doing a metering program now. They did receive grant funding from round one. And they're only looking at implementing meters on those users that are using greater than five acre feet per year. They're, they're not even gonna focus in on that two to five acre foot range. So again, these activities were budgeted. Uh, and so we're, we're calling this about $850,000. And finally, the, the last component that we, we actually did talk to DWR about, and it was, it was interesting because the representative has some familiarity with this type of issue. Um, and that's these bulk water stations. And so when you have some of these domestic water users, particularly in, in the foothills or in the hill, foothills in the area that I'm currently in, uh, but in the hills around you, uh, they can be highly susceptible to going dry. And so there are no ready alternatives for them. And so SLV has been proposing these two potable water stations. And so we budgeted working with your staff, $205,000, and that includes the cost of the station and the engineering and environmental work that would go into that. We, in addition to that, budgeted about $40,000 to identify domestic wells that are near systems and so that we could also conduct outreach as part of that overall program. So we're budgeting about $245,000. So today, and these numbers could change very slightly, the grant is due uh, in, in just over two weeks from tomorrow, about $2.6 million. And that's the overview of that. And happy to take any questions that you may have. Okay, um, maybe I'll go ahead and um, start. I think me and Jamie and, and Mark have probably seen a lot of this before in one way or another, but um, so so why don't I start with Jeff this time and see if he has any questions um, and then I'll go to Bob. Jeff, you're muted. I'm not sure I have any questions at this okay. point. All um, right. We we can cycle back. You don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Bob, do you have any questions? I, I do. 
No, you know, it might be helpful if you'd, if you'd leave, if you continue sharing your screen and leave that last table up. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> thank, thank you, Gail. Gail knows, Gail knows where I was going. <laughs> um, so I guess my first question is 2.6 million. So, you know, a little over what, 1%. Is this an all or nothing thing? That is, you either get all 2.6 or you get zero? No, so the state, and this is this is somewhat unique, uh, and this is a phenomenon they started recently, uh, is they do reserve the right to not fund the entirety of the program. And so they do require that we self-evaluate our priorities. And so they are currently listed in the way that we would consider them to be. I will say, first of all, component one is not an option. You have to have that as, as you're being your sort of top priority. They're going to give you the funding for that regardless. Um, so we've listed these in the order. Um, they could come back and say, you know, it's great, but we're not going to fund component four, so we'll give you $2.3 million and, and such. So okay, uh, so just they, they will not... I'm sorry, go ahead. Just, just to make sure I understand then, so the, the acceptance or rejection would be on a component basis, not on a project inside the component basis. Correct, correct. Okay. That, that is our understanding. Uh, that has been the answer that they have given. They will not go through and uh, pick out. And again, in, in a sense, it was part of the strategy on how we grouped the components together. But they did fit themes, right? Component two is clearly identified in the GSP to, to do this process at some point in time. Component three, these were all things that are identified as things that need to get done that aren't necessarily projects and management actions. And again, then component four was one that came up recently um, with this idea of these potable filling, water filling stations. They're not in and of themselves groundwater sustainability planning, but they're a really good thing to do, for example, right? Because when you pass Sigma, you have 20 years to come into compliance in this basin. That's the thing that people have to remember. It's a long, long-term game to reach uh, to, to reach sustainability, but we're, we're in the fourth year coming into a drought. So this is a really good mitigation, right? If to, to deal with right now. So that's, that's why that's in there. So it was not identified in the groundwater sustainability plan, but it's being included here in this package. Well, may the rains we've had in the last, uh, you know, few weeks continue uh, for, for the next couple, three months. That would be really great. Um, and, I, and I think that's probably one of the reasons why I, I want to dig into a little bit more into item number two under component two. All the other items on here seem pretty clear about what it is that's being covered, but I'm not clear what you mean by criteria development, bundled development, refinement, outreach, engagement. That's all very nebulous, and and at least at this level. And since I wasn't in the Santa Margarita meeting, and I was actually hoping for that specific information to come here, um, I'd, I'd like to learn a little bit more about what is involved in there. Because um, if any of that money is intended for um, continuing to flog the notion of injection wells in our area, I, I'm not really uh, in favor of that at all. I, I do disagree with you on where our focus needs to be, which I think is solely on uh, conjunctive use, continued conservation, efficiencies, that sort of thing. Um, but the notion of getting into uh, any kind of injection wells, given our size, given the geological challenges, given the relative wealth of the communities, uh, that's not something I'm interested in San Lorenzo Valley Water District participating in. If Scotts Valley and Santa Cruz want to do it, go, you know, more power to them. So Absolutely. what is involved in that? Right. So again, what, what that would have basically entail, and, and again, absolutely, uh, nobody's going to tell you what to do. This is not intended to say, hey, it looks like the, the, the economics favor you guys putting an injection well. No, this is the, the reason injection wells are in there is because it is something that Scotts Valley is interested in evaluating. So the criteria would be, uh, for example, will the results help us meet management objectives and minimum thresholds that are in the sustainability plan? So there are different solutions in different parts of the basin that will help us get there. So, and, and again, all of this is really to be developed. So it has not been established, but cost would be a criteria. Um, timing, 
Find me. Rob, Rob can, I, can I just jump in here? I, I think I maybe can help answer Bob's question a little bit more specifically. Okay. And, and that, because I think he, he wants to know a little bit more of the brass tax, and um, and I think it might also help uh, Jeff, because he hasn't been going to Santa Margarita, is that um, the discussions for injection wells have been entirely on the part of Scotts Valley and the city of Santa Cruz. And the idea would be that, um, the, you know, the city of Santa Cruz has thought about doing it in areas in the Scotts Valley part of the basin, okay? and potentially using some old Scotts Valley wells that have been abandoned for one reason or another or areas that are around it. And, um, and similarly, Scotts Valley um, has been thinking about that. And, you know, they don't have the advantage that we do of being able to use both surface and um, uh, groundwater. So there's nothing in that that commits us as, as a district to getting involved in any kind of injection projects. And for, for the exact reason that, well, two reasons. One, our part of the basin is in better shape than Scotts Valley's part of the basin uh, in terms of groundwater levels. Um, two, we have the benefit of being able to exercise conjunctive use better. And so we may, you know, I think we're all hopeful that when you combine that with conservation, we don't need it. But the, but the, so, we're not committing to doing any of that. And so, but, but what, what we are committing here, it seems like then, is we're going to spend close to a million dollars on the evaluation uh, to, to enable Scotts Valley and Santa Cruz to evaluate injection wells as part of this overall process. And we get 350000 to look at Loch Lomond. Is that kind of the way it breaks down? Because, I again, the the... Everything on here is very specific, except for bullets, or the second and third line items under component two. And I'm trying to just I model think, this in my mind, a, what it is I, we're I think trying that to is a, That is a, a you know, at, at a 30,000 foot level, it's a, it's a fair assessment. I think if you drill down a little bit deeper, what you would find is that the information that will come out of uh, some of line two and three under component two, will be, for example, modeling of what happens when you do certain things in the basin, you know, injection. So it'll be looking at exploring this whole problem of, uh, you know, will it work putting water into the Lompico? Okay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, is it safe to do that? So there, there are benefits that, that we acquire in terms of knowledge and modeling of the whole basin. There'll be, you know, notice modeling to assess bundles. You know, another thing that will, I think, might be potentially helpful to us, and correct me if I'm wrong, wrong, Rob, but one of the things that will probably be modeled is that Santa Cruz, that, excuse me, Scotts Valley will be trying to figure out some of these more passive ways of recharging, you know, from surface waters. Um, you know, there might be potential things that we could think about doing over in the, um, the in some of our areas around Santa Margarita. Um, where we could do the same kinds of things, where we have highly permeable things, especially where it overlies the Lumpico. So, so there, there are, well, there will be benefits in the modeling. Um, so, you know, it's not that we're just getting the 350 um, k. That there will be benefits from that other million dollars that will accrue to us. But, but you, you know, at a high level, you're right. That it mostly goes to Santa Cruz. I, I, I just, I just know that Scotts Valley and City of Santa Cruz are hot for injection wells. And so if there's any kind of focus on this, it's going to, most of the money is going to go in, into that area, but it would be very interesting if they could generously include, you know, Olympia and, and some of the other areas in terms of um, water, um, uh, stormwater, you know, seepage, basically getting getting back into the uh, into the aquifer. I, I mean, at a at a high level, you know, our contribution historically has been around thirty percent, I think, um, uh, in terms of operating expenses. So we get you know somewhere around um, close to thirty percent of of the money here for component two that directly uh, goes to us. Okay, sounds good. Um, and, you know, maybe the rest of it will be done through some of the secondary effects we get off having better modeling, which I do agree, uh, you know, both at an engineering and science level would be would be interesting to have. But, um, but 
yeah, Rob, I, you know, the, the notion of San Lorenzo Valley Water District um, ratepayers popping up for injection wells in any way, shape, or form doesn't um, doesn't excite me in, in any way. So um, I'm going to be focused really on the Loch Lomond because I think that is where ultimately the entire basin can get the biggest bang for the buck by shuffling the surface water around because, in fact, we can move surface water all the way from the tip, the, the north tip of Santa Margarita, all the way down to um, Scotts Valley and Santa Cruz with the new um, grant that Scotts Valley got to construct an interconnect with them, will even be able to ship it both ways either way. So in fact, that highway, and we just got them putting in the Quail Hollow line, which gives us a super highway all the way down to Scotts Valley. So that water can actually move. And to me, that is the fastest least expensive, least intrusive, and most environmentally desirable way um, to uh, deal with our groundwater issues today. Yes, and I, I, I want to emphasize that this that middle component, that includes the in-lieu conjunctive use program. And my understanding, I'm, I'm six weeks into the job, uh, so I'm still learning a lot. But my understanding is that you're proposing to do interdistrict conjunctive use, working with Scotts Valley potentially moving across the, that line, right? Across well, the or line. Yeah, or they'll get the water from Santa Cruz. I mean, once right. they have two interconnects, so, they can they can negotiate the deal they want. Absolutely, and so so I do believe that that analysis is really to me. If I didn't, I, I stated it. I'm the biggest fan of in lieu conjunctive use. I always think that that's where you start, right? So I do believe that this analysis could reveal that that's the first thing we want to do and that we want to maximize the use of that before you start looking at other alternatives. So this is not intended to just feed the pet projects for any individual agency. This is intended to look at a reasonable suite of alternatives. And so there are limits to conjunctive use at times though, right? The only limitation that always concerns me, and, and again, the area that I'm working in, is there tends to be a mis mismatch between the availability of surface water and demand, right? So when it's really wet in the winter, if you don't have an existing demand to offset, then you can't achieve in lieu conjunctive use. So you do look at other means, direct means of recharging. So- well, I, I mean, Rob, unfortunately, since all of Scotts Valley is on wells, including our portion of it, um, you know, immediately, if you wanna, you know, serve that entire area for, four to six months on surface water. I don't know, that seems like a pretty big impact on the groundwater levels over a very short period of time. And I'm you know, i not a scientist at, at your level or, or Gail's level, but I do know numbers a little bit. And I, that seems to me to be really an efficient way to go. Look, I get your point um, uh, about that, um, but I, you know, I think there's a plan here that could be executed with um, conjunctive use across um, multiple agencies, running that for five to seven years to see what the groundwater levels actually look like before even starting down injection well paths and spending money on that. That to me is the biggest bang for the buck immediately. And the infrastructure is already in place to do that. All we got to do is get, I mean, and if, if the city of Santa Cruz hadn't decided they wanted to throw a monkey wrench into our process, um, we would be well on the way to having that done, um, but politics being what it is. So, uh, yeah, this this to me, the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency maybe ought to be looking at how do we address the concerns that the, um, the city of Santa Cruz put in that's requiring us to do way more work on getting our water rights redone um, in order to be able to advance that faster. To me, that's that's a really good use of money. And I don't think that's on the list. Can can you clarify that, Rob, or maybe Carly, whether the um, targeted environmental impact state EIR there is is that with regard to uh, putting in a pipeline and to Loch Lomond and uh, upgrading the Kirby plant, or is that with regard to uh, the our are being forced by Santa Cruz to take on a much more uh, elaborate environmental impact uh, statement to get our conjunctive uh, use uh, 
water rights petition. So which one of those is that referring to? We haven't started the actual water rights petition portion. We've really only focused on the environmental um, with the ISMND that we initially went through, and that's where we received the comments from the city of Santa Cruz. So um, I believe, Bob, is that what you're referring to? Yes, but I think what Gail's referring to is you've got focused EIR on here. I took that to mean focused Which EIR one is for Loch Lomond, not for yeah. uh, our water rights in general. Right. This this is more focused on it's the the greater conjunctive use, uh, which also can includes the Loch Lomond component. Okay, but so the feasibility. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. If three hundred fifty thousand dollars compared to what we're going to be spending on that EIR and the delays in actually getting groundwater um, uh, sustainability done because Santa Cruz got in the way here um, is uh, that that is that I don't believe is going to cover the entire amount and certainly won't cover it if we're also looking at Loch Lomond uh, evaluation. To me, we're we're our priorities in this funding aren't really where we get the immediate biggest bang for the buck clearing out all the regulatory and politics stuff as quickly as possible. Okay. I'm inclined to agree with you, Bob, but um, uh, go ahead. Mark, how about you? Yes. <clears throat> I'm pleased to see that Loch Lomond um, feasibility is listed here. I have to agree with Bob on um, the second item under component two for the criteria development, bundle development. I don't think that that could be written in a more obscure <laughs> manner um, to <laughs> just, um, and, and I have peripherally been following uh, Santa Margarita meetings as the alternate. And that doesn't mean anything to me. Uh, the modeling in item three, yes, I can understand what that is, but a uh, good job of hiding whatever is truly in there for that 577,000. Um, and I hope that, um, that that aspect doesn't negatively detract from evaluation of what I consider to be a fairly concrete and substantial item, the Loch Lomond conjunctive use. I can put my hands and my brain around that part of it, that it doesn't negatively detract from reviewers' aspects of the overall component to, since what I heard you say, Rob, is that um, the state can award on a component by component basis. So uh, that's all that I wanted to comment on that. Thanks. I'll come back to you, Bob, but I want to go to Jamie first, okay? You can come to me, but I'm just going to say that I actually really agree with Bob uh, on this one. Which I know, <laughs> like, Bob, are you okay? <laughs> and I'm going to faint. <laughs> I, I thought he made an excellent point, um, and I, I tend to think that, you know, we do need to focus on uh, the projects that we think are, are most realistic and that will actually, you know, Im improve um, life <laughs> for our customers. And I, I have a real concern about the fact that we're just spending on, you know, half a million, a quarter, quarter you know, 20% of this money um, in a way that I don't see. Uh, any any actual outcome? So, thanks, Bob. Uh, Jeff. So, this is my first real exposure to Santa Margarita large scale planning and projects, but I, I just have a an overall feeling that there's an awful lot of money in here for things that have very vague outputs uh, that are a, a lot of paperwork as opposed to shovel work, I guess is what I'm going to say. Um, I know you have to plan things, but uh, this looks like a, a, a huge planning exercise to me. And uh, I'd like to see a little more specific outputs uh, built into the project. 
And I do think Bob is on the right track. Uh, I'll, I'll come back. Rob or Tim, do you want to respond to that before uh, those comments before I go back to Bob? I, I would agree that it is a huge planning exercise. Um, I'm coming into this and the groundwater sustainability plan had that listed as an item to do this planning exercise. So I'm facilitating the will of the group um, as I as I came here. Uh, and again, I, I do believe that the intended outcome is to come up with a an impartial look at the things that need to be done to reach sustainability. And I do believe that the in lieu conjunctive use program uh, will be will shine essentially as as a critical component of those solutions. So I wish you'd said that very specifically up front. <laughs> I mean, I guess I would add to Rob's comments by saying, yeah, this is this is directly coming out of the multi-year groundwater sustainability plan development. There is a specific action in there that talks about advancing um, the understanding of the projects and management actions within the plan. And so the steps preliminary to this before either Rob and I were on board was for the um, for the staff and for the Santa Margarita board to identify um, within the projects and management actions uh, identified within the plan these different tiers of group projects in there, and there was a um, a fairly detailed matrix that identified on a um, sort of project by project in some cases grouped projects, more conceptual, um, where things were at. And so was there a gap, for example, in um, that a preliminary feasibility study could address or uh, water availability analysis? Quite a lot of assessment type activities. That is, that is very much, you are correct in identifying that. There's a lot of um, additional technical planning that needs to happen before the um, shovel ready implementation portion of it occurs. And so um, that's that's the framework that we stepped into. And that's sort of the direction that was um, uh, that was presented in terms of us working within that framework and then trying to identify within that what we think um, is the most competitive suite of uh, projects given the criteria we've looked at. I think the other, the last thing I might add is that it is different in that the model that the overall structure um, that Santa Margarita is dealing with is, is the basin as a whole. So it's not individual agency. While each of the individual agencies has their um, respective priorities um, and what may work best within their individual um, jurisdiction, Overall, the intent of the groundwater sustainability plan is to look at the basin and to achieve sustainability in the basin. And so that's that is uh, that's cooked into the Sigma framework as well. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll just say, you know, you you, um, you know, my comments from at Santa Margarita meetings and I from early on have said I wanted to see more doing and less uh, consultants. Yes. Yes. And so I, I think I'm, I'm actually, it's very odd because I have not discussed this with the rest of the board. So when I hear Bob, you know, saying these things that, that are essentially echoing a lot of the things that I've felt, um, I, I kind of feel like, okay, I was on the right track and I wasn't successful, uh, but at least I was, I was trying. I think I, I'm a little disappointed tonight that I, I was hoping that in having you here, um, you know, at the, at the last Santa Margarita meeting, the reason I was so un, unhappy was that we were provided with uh, a, a list that had almost no numbers associated with it, but we finally have some numbers, but I think it would have really helped. Um, for example, uh, on the, Five hundred and seventy-seven thousand dollars and four fifty-one. I mean, you obviously must have a breakdown uh, of what that means. Um, if 
you know, and, and it would have helped if we had seen that. Um, you know, if you to, to get a number that's that precise, 451 numbers, you've got to have a breakdown, and we're not seeing it now. And it might have been a little bit more helpful for the board if they they could have seen what that was that was about. Having said all of that, I think um, basically the important thing for us to do tonight is that we pass this resolution because it is a way for us um, to get um, the 350 thousand. Uh, to move forward on um, our Loch Lomond conjunctive use. Um, and the other thing it does, which maybe didn't come through clearly enough, is that um, as Rob and Tim pointed out, it's, it's very expensive to run Santa Margarita. And this grant will go a long way towards paying those annual administrative and monitoring things. For example, under component three, you know, the surface monitoring, we have to do that. The state mandates it. The annual reporting um, is an important one. Um, this explore long-term GSP funding options is another really important one because we have to find some way that we distribute the costs of running Santa Margarita across the whole basin um, and all the people that use water and um, especially those that use groundwater across the basin. So. It's not just the 350, um, it's it's also these other components here, or our share of those, which would be over 30% um, that is being paid for here. So this, whatever dissatisfactions I, I might be expressing, um, I think I still am strongly in favor of us signing this resolution in support of the uh, Santa Margarita sub submitting this proposal uh, because it's going to help us out financially. Bob. Just a, just a few final thoughts. Um, I, I'm certainly willing to um, be pleasantly surprised if the um, analysis comes back even handed. Um, I, I've been doing this a, a long time and I just know when, when agencies are hot for something, that's where the funding tends to go. Um, so, so please do surprise me, and, and that would be a really good thing. What you talked about was one of the reasons I was so critical of the GSP and its existing uh, form, because I felt that by opening the GSP up to a lot of options that I, that I thought were neither economically nor environmentally feasible for our area, and certainly not for the San Lorenzo Valley Water District, we were, in fact, diluting our focus away from where we can get immediate and substantial benefit with very, very low cost. Um, and, but the politics being what they are, we got the GSP that we got, and here we are. The third thing I would say is that if I'm a state agency looking at this, and a state agency that's going to want to start weaning it, um, themselves off of funding operating expenses, um, I'm going to drop component three. Uh, very quickly, because I'm going to say, hey, look, you know, we're really shifting here to implementation stuff, and you're going to be on your own for funding, um, you know, operating expenses for the groundwater agency going forward. Um, you know, the grants we got early on were sort of the drug you get to get you hooked on it, and then eventually you get weaned off of that. If I'd been putting this together, I would have put the component three things under component two, along with the SLV Loch Lomond and EIR and put the criteria as component three, given that you're mixing both implementation and operating, you have a higher uh, possibility, given that I think our overall possibility here is probably lower than others of actually getting that. Um, but be that as it may, here we are. I, I, I continue to be really concerned about the fact that the politics of the situation the politics of the city of Santa Cruz are getting in the way of actually delivering meaningful, immediate groundwater benefits to our community and our groundwater basin in a way that under current situation, we're just getting delayed, 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 delayed. The fish aren't helped, the groundwater isn't helped, the people aren't helped, and it's really time to get off of this and get focused on implementation. Block Loman's great, I'm glad it's on there, but even if we get information back. It is years away from being implementable, whereas the conjunctive use can be in, implemented very quickly 
if Santa Cruz wouldn't didn't do what they were what they did. Uh, this is a, from my point of view, none of this is beneficial for the community, but I want the 350,000 at least, and so we'll grin and bear it um, while we continue to play games here with consultants that don't deliver meaningful results for our community. I, 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 it, this is why people get frustrated. Here, here, Bob. Would anybody like to make a motion? I'd like to make a motion. We uh, do we need to go to the community? Well, let's so let's have a motion on yes. the table, then I'll okay. go out to the community for comments. Um, I'd like to make a motion that our board uh, support the application to the California Department of Water Resources for the grant funding um, in the items as laid out in front of us uh, on this uh, table for the two point six two five million dollars. Chair Mayhood, may I suggest we, a modification to the motion? Yeah, because it is a resolution that we're adopting. Go, go ahead. Right, so I, I'd like to suggest um, Director Smoley, if it's acceptable to you um, to, to, to restate the motion sure. um, as being to adopt the resolution that's in the uh, board packet for this item. Okay, thank you. I wasn't Which has the that. effect that you described. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dina. Yes, so moved. Is there a second? Well, I'll second it. Um, I do have a question uh, about the res about the resolution. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I'm. I'm most comfortable with resolutions regarding funding like this, that they actually include the specifics around what the money is being applied for. Um, is it possible that the, because the wording right now basically doesn't commit the anybody to anything other than we're signing it off on some grant that all we've really seen is this presentation and one page of funding. So um, what assurances do we have that those components are actually the ones that are gonna be submitted? and that aren't going to be changed between now and the 16th. Good Sorry, point. I have to ask, but sometimes things change. Rob or Tim, you wanna to respond to that? I mean, I guess my response would be, we've been working quite closely with district staff throughout the process. And so they're helping to shape what you are seeing in front of you. And so I think that we have been responsive along the way to incorporating their comments. And so I don't anticipate a sort of bait and switch scenario of having this board approve one thing. In fact, we end up in the next couple of weeks dramatically revising it. You know, I, I think there's the potential that amounts shift slightly, but I think we're bringing you the substantively um, what we intend to uh, submit at this point. Mark, I mean, it's not in our interest, Director Foltz, to, um, to, to not work cooperatively with staff or to disregard what we're hearing from, from Rick or Harley. I mean, that, that's not the intent at all. Um, and so, um, I don't know, Rob, you can add to it if you think there's any potential that these amounts... No, I don't need Rob to add to it. Mark, go ahead. Yes. Um, Thanks, Tim. I don't think we need, or personally, I don't need Rob to comment on it. Um, I did want to follow on what Bob was asking. I'm not concerned about uh, San Lorenzo Valley Water District staff um, altering or changing what's in here. Um, but given the other uh, member participants in the Santa Margarita Agency, um, are any of those uh, participants going to change what's in here? Um, along the lines of, well, they no longer like that one on the Loch Lomond. So let's just take that out. Um, yep. Got it. I understand. Okay. Now. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think you picked a good example in Loch Lomond in that that has been clearly communicated as a priority, both at the staff and at the board level. So um, that aspect of component two is, is well, I, I can confidently say is not 
changing. Um, I think the budget estimates on some of the respective subtasks that we are laid out here, that's where um, that's where I would like Rob to comment actually. I mean, Rob, do you see a scenario in which these sub amounts here under whether it's component two or component three? I know this has been a, a lot of back and forth with um, multiple technical consultants in addition to agency staff and trying to refine these numbers and to get budget estimates both from staff as well as consultants. Um, do you see a scenario where those are significantly changing on any of those? Not significant. You know, I, I'll give you an example. This week, uh, under the um, the de minimis meterings, I said, oh, I didn't budget enough of my hours in there to offset some of my costs that I know I'm going to have. So I increased it by about $10,000. So uh, very minimal types of, of changes might happen there, but I don't see any big picture changes here at all that are occurring. Jeff? Why don't we incorporate the chart in the motion with the caveat that uh, no number in that chart shall change more than 10% between now and- yeah, I, I, I understand the sentiment that goes into that, but I, yeah. I don't think we wanna do that because this is supposed to be a go in as a, a letter of support that Santa Margarita will include in the application. And I think that that would create um, just an image that you don't want to do for the purposes of the proposal. I think we can fight among ourselves, but I think that when it comes to how we um, present ourselves to the state, we, we don't want to, don't want to do that. And I, I guess, Frankly, at this stage, I'm not worried about what you and Bob are talking about. I, 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 I don't really see this changing that much, you know, maybe at the margins. I think the fact that they've put number two, um, you know, that they've put Loch Lomond right there at the top, as, as Rob was saying, that everything's listed in order of priority. And that that hasn't changed, or if anything, it's moved up, I think, over, you know, the last year that I've seen this. So I... Um, you know, I, even though I've, I've grumbled at various times that I, I feel like the process is far too dominated by Santa Cruz, I, I, I have faith that it's not going to uh, morph after we pass this. Thank, thank you, Gail. I think it's a good trust building exercise. So <laughs> let's, okay. let's, let's see what happens. Yeah. Go ahead, Brian. make a final comment on that. Uh, this resolution is effectively, uh, while you're being supportive, and we very much appreciate it, the requirement of the resolution is to basically authorize this application to include projects that are on your behalf. Right. So again, that's you're re really saying, yes, you may you may apply for some funding for us for the Loch Lomond project for the both water stations and, and such. Okay, let, let me go uh, out to our attendees and then I'll come back if the board has any more comments. Um, are there any questions from the attendees? Cynthia. I just wanna oh, say I agree with all of the comments and the discussion and I am glad that the consultants have listened um, to your discussion and understand our interests. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Any other comments from the um, attendees? Okay, if not, let me go back to the board. If there are any further comments, we have a motion on the table. Any more comments on that motion? If not, um, Holly, would you go ahead and take a roll call vote, please? President Mayhood? Aye. Vice President Ackerman? Yes. Director Fultz? Yes. Director Hill? Yes. Director Smalley? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. I want to thank uh, Tim and Rob. 
uh, for coming. And I, I have to, um, I, I, I do want to say something in their defense and that, that what <laughs> that they, they have only been involved in this for a while. And I think what they've been bombarded by tonight is a certain frustration that, that we in the district and certainly me being engaged with Santa Margarita for the last year uh, of our sense that, um, that, that we're the, we're the, the little mosquito and um, Santa Cruz is, you know, the gorilla in the room. And we, uh, we've been multiple times been um, sort of victimized by that. And so um, I, I, I don't want you to take it personally. And, you know, and I feel a little bad that you, the two of you got beat up on tonight because frankly, you don't deserve it. You're, you're, you're coming in at the end of the game. Uh, and, uh, but it is what it is. Okay, so I appreciate you uh, coming tonight and talking to us. So thank you. Yeah, we appreciate the opportunity and hopefully we'll have a successful grant at the end. Yes. Great. Thanks, everybody. Okay, thank you. Um, next item of business is a long service line agreement. Yes, Chair, thank you. And I'll ask the district engineer to present this item to the board. Josh. Thank you, Rick. This is a fairly straightforward long service line agreement for a parcel just off of Teal Drive outside of Boulder Creek. We have no plans to extend our mains in that area. So the only way we can serve this parcel is through a long line. The owner of the parcel has acquired the requisite easement for the service line. And that's, I guess that's really all I have to say about it. So I'll take questions. Are there any questions from the board regarding this? Pretty straightforward. Uh, Mark? Um, yes, I'll ask uh, one of Bob's questions. Is this the um, current up-to-date uh, service agreement? since we've heard that for other long line service agreements in the past? This is indeed the format used most recently. Okay, good. Um, is a uh, one inch meter more expensive to install uh, or to purchase than the five eighths meters? A one inch meter does cost more than a five eighths meter. The difference is incremental. The installation okay. negligible. Okay. And are, are we being compensated for that? Or is that part of the the uh, what is it, the <coughs> the service fee connection fee that they're paying? It's 50 it is bucks. Yeah. As okay. Rick noted, it's fifty dollars, but um oh okay. Um minimal. Um, we've seen easement maps in the past with these long line service agreements. Um, should there have been one with this one? This one, we don't have a map. We have a legal description. Okay. And I okay. don't see that it was actually included in the packet. I can provide it. Um, I, I, I wouldn't uh, be able to read through it anyhow and understand all of it. I don't need it. I just want to make sure that we are complete with that, uh, if that's what it takes to file this. That is required, okay. and yes, it is complete. Okay. All right. Thank you. That addresses my questions. Bob? Mark almost answered, asked all of them. So <laughs> um, just really quickly on the easement uh, legal description, which, which I do read. <laughs> Um, the sort of the best practice moving forward probably should be including maps, though. It, it does help people, I think, more easily identify what the uh, legal description language is because most people can't read legal description languages. Um, the question I had, though, was on why the one inch. Um, you mentioned it was for fire flow, but, you know, my understanding is that typically we handle fire um, sprinkler, I'm assuming that's for a fire sprinkler, that we that we handle that differently. Um, uh, or, or is this sort of the new policy that we have going forward that if someone does have sprinklers, we install a one inch um, uh, in lieu of a five eighths, but only charge them for the five eighths inch price? That is indeed our policy. It has been for 
some months now. Uh, we started late last year. Um, Has that been the, formalized? We have not formalized it. It has been our process. Yeah, could, if, could, could we formalize that? I think that would be important to that. include in, and also include in the um, the rate schedule information that the customers might um, might encounter. I think that would be very helpful to do. We can do that. Yeah, and by the way, I do think it's a great thing that to do that that way. So I have no objection to it. I just think it needs to be formalized so that yeah. customers know what they're what they're uh, getting into, especially given that fire sprinklers are becoming uh, regrettably from a cost point of view, more important to our community. Okay. Are there any questions among the attendees? Uh, seeing none, um, would anybody like to make a motion? Um, sure, I'll make a motion. We. Uh, approve the long line service agreement um, as put in front of us for um... uh, here let me again this is another resolution so i'm just going to do it okay. for you mark thank you <laughs> that uh, i move that we adopt uh the resolution in the packet uh that approves a agreement regarding water service for michael smith in boulder creek is there a second thank you I'll second. Okay. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 So Mark, just make it clear uh, what the vote was so it can be recorded on the resolution. Yes, I will. It was uh, five in favor. Unanimous. Okay. Um, Next item, leak adjustment notice of appeal. Yes, thank you, Chair. Yes, on uh, on November 4th, uh, 2022, the board received an email from Barbara Morehouse uh, McMaster's appealing the district's finding that a requested second leak adjustment was denied as it did not conform to district policy. Um, uh, our policy is if you incur a larger leak within the five year period, you may submit another leak adjustment request to receive the difference between the current and prior leak adjustment amounts. Uh, the second leak was not greater than the first leak. Uh, the second leak um, went uh, through a, uh, a, a two month period. And then the, uh, or the, the first leak went through a two month period which made the, the amount larger. And then the second leak was only through a one month billing period. Um, seeing that this leak, uh, the second leak did not meet district policy, uh, the leak, a second leak adjustment was denied. The first leak was in uh, April of 2022. Um, and it was for uh, two consecutive months of 25 and 32 units, totaling 57 units. Um, for the second leak adjustment, we only used the one month of 36 meters for the meter reading period. So it's recommended uh, due to the fact that the second leak adjustment um, did not uh, comply with policy that the board deny their request uh, for appeal. I do believe uh, Ms. Morehouse is present tonight and most likely wishes to uh, address the board. Um, and it, we will be more than happy, the finance manager will be more than happy or myself to answer any other questions on how the leak was calculated. Okay. Um, it, if it's okay with the board, should I have, I would have uh, yeah. recognized sure. uh, Barbara. Yes. Okay. Go ahead, Barbara. I think I'm in, am I not? Yes, you are. Okay, thank you. Um, the reason that I am appealing this decision is I don't own this home. I'm a renter. So I'm not financially responsible for the upkeep of the water line and the yard that busted in April or the water heater that busted in August. So I'm a little, uh, I'd say, upset that I'm expected to, uh, excuse me, to pay for this uh, when this isn't the home that I, I mean, if I own this home, no problem. 
not even a blurb out of me, but I don't own this home. Okay, uh, Gina. Um, th thanks for recognizing me, Chair Mayhood. I before um, the board uh, delves into the discussion of the of the appeal, I just wanted to make two quick comments on the legal front. Um, the first being that um, I, I would encourage the board to, to think of an appeal as a process of determining whether staff applied the district's policies correctly to the particular situation. <laughs> Um, and secondly, okay, that um, the district, as you know, has transitioned to um, making the account, the owner, the account holder in all purposes, and therefore the legal relationship is really between the district and the, uh, the owner, um, which makes it... Uh, Unfortunately, you know, legally a little bit tenuous to get involved in um, issues that affect the relationship between the landlord and the tenant. And, that, that, and that's all I will um, say unless there are questions about those points. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Gina. Uh, I'll recognize Jamie first. <laughs> Jamie, go ahead. Oh, I, I said, I think Bob had his hand up first. No, I I am i don't know his oh. call who's ever raised yeah, his yeah. hand first. I spread it around. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Just check. Um, so I, you know, I guess I was, uh, I don't really have a specific question about this circumstance. It sounds like we, we you know, did all of the things that um, are within our policy to do. Um, I guess, uh, Gina kind of spoke to my concern, which was that, well, I am, you know, incredibly sympathetic to how frustrating it must be to have these water bills related to, you know, equipment failures in your rental home that you don't own. That is a conversation between you and, and your landlord in terms of whose responsibility falls to what for those costs. So I appreciate that this is a big bill, but I, I'm not sure that the water district policy um, can accommodate your concerns necessarily because that, as Gina said, puts us between you and your landlord and creates precedent for all of the other renters who are water district customers. So um, that's kind of where my thinking is at on this right now that I, I am in the unfortunate place of feeling like we're going to have to reject the request. Huh? You're muted, Bob. I'm. You're still muted. I unmuted myself and then someone muted me again. Maybe that's, uh, you know, CTV. Sorry about that. Um, I had a clarification question. question. Wh whose name is actually on the bill? Is that something I can answer? Sure. Okay, uh, the bill comes as Sally Real, care of Barbara McMaster's. Okay, so why is it, why is, so uh, the, the reason I asked that is I, I distinctly remember, though, you know, it's been a couple of years, so maybe my memory is faulty, but as part of the process by which we stopped doing turnoffs, um, one of the, one of the uh, side effects of that due to the legal uh, aspects that Gina, I think, very uh, capably analyzed was that we were no longer able to do tenant billing. Um, and so um, when I when I first heard about this, I was like, well, I mean, Barbara, you sound like you're the tenant. So I'm not sure why you would be getting the bill or have the legal responsibility for paying the bill if, in fact, our policy does not allow for tenant billing any longer, or did we, when I moved off the budget committee, um, did we subsequently come up with a way to do tenant billing that still allowed us to comply with um, whatever a, a, B something, I forget what the number was, um, that, that really forced this really long, complex and expensive process for turnoffs that it was just simpler not to do them anymore and less expensive. Uh, Gina, it sounds like you might have some insights into this. 
Go ahead, Gina. Yeah, if, if I may, yeah, the district does not do tenant billing. However, some owners have been directing bills to their customers via the care of line. Um, but nevertheless, the owner is the account holder and the customer. Um, and unfortunately, you know, I, I, I wouldn't recommend that the district um, alter, you know, that legal relationship by recognizing the care of as sort of the customer okay. or the responsible party for the bill. Okay, so I wanted to make I wanted to make that clear then. So the owner of the property really is the um, is the responsible party for the bill. And it sounds like if there's any issue here between on, on how this bill gets paid, the issue is between Barbara, you and your landlord. It's not between you and San Lorenzo Valley Water District, <laughs> right? And so you're not legally the, it, my understanding based on this conversation here is you're not legally responsible for that uh, bill at this point uh, from the district's point of view. Maybe it may be an agreement that you have with your landlord. That's separate. But from a district point of view, the bill goes to the, the owner of the property, not to the tenant. Okay, then so then if then if you guys are billing for the water, then wouldn't the water bill need to go to her? I think that that was explained, Barbara. Barbara, I think that that was explained that the that the fact that it's delivered to you is just a, a courtesy. Okay. Uh, that that perhaps your, you know, your landowner. Um, it's an agreement between the tenants and the landowner, right? Yeah, right. The, the, the your rental agreement. Made the decision that she wants the bill to go to the tenant. I'm assuming it probably is in their rental contract, though I would have no idea of whether that's true or not, right? So, and so. Yeah, uh, well, so, we don't want to get involved in that well, level of detail. Well, my, my point is, my point is, from a standing point of view, the appeal couldn't even be issued by Barbara anyway, because she's not the person we recognize as the responsible party. The responsible party has to be the one to do the appeal. So, quick question. Uh, Barbara, when you were asked earlier, what name was on the bill, you gave another person's name and then care of you. Who is that other person? Sally Real. Uh, no, but I mean, who is she in this relationship? Uh, she would be my la my landlord. Then she's the legal customer. Right. Right there. I, I think, though, that Barbara did bring the initial leak to us. I'm assuming it was, I mean, Barbara, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you brought us the initial leak request, leak adjustment request, which we granted. And and therefore you brought us the second one. So I understand why you believe that this is the path forward for appeal, but I, I tend to agree with what my fellow directors are saying in ter and, and our lawyer in terms of what the appropriate relationship here is. And so, you know, I'm just, I don't know how we can go forward here. Well, let me say that if we grant, if she brought the appeal the first time, my question would be, why did we go through the process with her the first time, given she's not the um, the the responsible party that the district recognizes? Again, going back to our policy, we don't do tenant billing anymore. Therefore, tenants aren't involved, shouldn't be involved in the appeals process either. Rick, you want to answer that? And we're reviewing that process right now. This is the first time the situation has come up. So the staff, uh, the finance manager, myself, and district legal counsel have been reviewing this uh, internally, and and we'll be you know trying to um, make sure that we do not in the future. Um, deal with tenants um, as they are not the legal responsible uh, for the account. I, so I, I think all of this discussion is, you know, every I agree with what everybody said here and that, that this, you know, any kind of appeal should be brought by the owner. But actually the, the thing that's in front of us is that irregardless of whether it was the owner or the renter or what, even if it had been by the owner, um, this second time, it it would be turned down because it doesn't meet the criteria of the department of the district's uh, policy about the second leak has to be bigger because it's That's not. Great. 
And so I, to me, that that is, you know, while I agree with all this other discussion and that we need to clean this up, and I'm glad to hear that, that from Rick that we are cleaning this up, I think to me, the, the reason to turn down this appeal is on the grounds that I believe Rick as district manager turned it down, which is that the second leak was smaller than the first leak. Um, and so that even if the owner came back, uh, it, it would not be granted. Bob? Is it possible to um, set up a 12 month payment plan for this portion, for just this bill? doesn't affect any of the other bills. Um, and is that something the owner could come in and request? Is that possible or? Uh, and, I, and I'll refer to uh, the finance manager. I do believe we do have, uh, I believe the law requires us to make payment arrangements and so forth. I'll let either Gina or uh, Kendra speak to that. Yes, Bob, that is correct. Uh, we do offer payment arrangements per the leak adjustment policy. Um, it just states that, uh, let's see, the full repayment shall occur within 12 months from determination. Um, so any any balance left over from after the credit was applied for the leak uh, should be repaid within 12 months. Great. Thank you, Kimberly. Mm -hmm. and, and again, that would have to be the owner to come in and, and apply for that. So wait, now I'm a little confused. Did I just ruin the credit that I got in April? No, we're not going to. We will okay, not I'm just checking. do anything about that. Uh, okay. we, we, that, that you're, you're fine there. It was just that I think as we discussed this, we, we recognized that that was kind of a mistake, that, that we should have uh, been dealing with the, the landlord. But uh, we're, not, we're not going to change that. The, I think... What I would like to move now is that we turn down this appeal because it does, uh, um, the staff applied the district policy correctly. The second leak was smaller than the first leak. Um, and so it doesn't meet the policy for uh, granting more of an adjustment. Do we, do we need a vote on that? Chair, Chair Mayhood, if I, if I may make two procedural suggestions. Um, one is to, to make that a motion for a vote, and secondly, to go out to any other members of the public. Well, I, I, I meant it to be a motion and to be seconded, and then if we had a motion, I would go out to the rest of the public. Do I, I have will a second. second? I will second that. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any other comments um, from the attendees? Okay. Um, Holly, would you take a roll call vote, please? President Mayhood? Aye. Vice President Ackman? Yes. Director Fultz? Yes. Director Hill? Yes. Director Smalley? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Okay. And good luck, Barb. Thank you. Thank you for coming, Barbara. Sorry. Um, last item of uh, new business is discrimination, harassment, and retaliation prevention policy. Uh, Gina, were you going to take that? Oh, it's pretty much. Uh... Sure, I can take that. Um, this one should be straightforward. There have not been any um, legal changes necessitating updates to the policy. So the policy in front of you has not changed from prior years. Um, the board, the board policy manual does require an annual review, which is why it is nonetheless coming to the board for a look uh, in December, even though we're not recommending changes to the policy. Um, I, I have made sure that the resolution for this readoption indicates that the policy will continue in effect, regardless of whether the, you know, the board readopts it each year in December, just to make sure that there's no lapse. Um, and that's really the only, um, I guess, tweak of interest that may be of interest to the board. Okay. Are there any comments or questions about this? Among the board? What do you know? How about among uh, our attendees? Okay. 
Um, would anybody like to make a motion to adopt the resolution? I'll move the recommendation uh, for the uh, resolution to adopt the district's discrimination, harassment, and retaliation prevention policy for 2023 and subsequent years. Thank you. I'll second that. Okay. Um, Holly? President Mayhood? Aye. President Ackman? Yes. Director Fultz? Yes. Director Hill? Yes. Director Smalley? Yes. Okay, the motion passes unanimously. Um, that brings us to the consent agenda. Um, is there anything anybody would like to take off of the consent agenda? Board members, how about from members that are at the, of the audience or attendees? No, all right, then the consent agenda is adopted. Um, next we have uh, district reports. And I know that um, Rick does have a district manager report tonight. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, last night we held a Felton Heights tank replacement uh, outreach meeting uh, at the Felton Library. Uh, it was well attended uh, by uh, the residents of Felton Heights in person. Uh, plus, we had a, a few uh, people attending by Zoom. Um, we presented a alternative choice or, a, or an alternative uh, choice to uh, the location that we have been uh, talking about uh, uh, placing the tank on, on John Erickson's property. The alternative choice was basically south of that tank, just on the other side of the dirt access road uh, on uh, still on John Erickson's property. Um, the, the, the appeal of this was it, uh, this tank site, the tank would be um, blocked visually by a large uh, uh, row of uh, redwood trees. Uh, the residents voiced support uh, for this project relocating uh, to the to the south uh, site on John's property. However, it was clear from the residents that the support was based on the district's ability to work with John Erickson to uh, obtain uh, a property, either easement or purchase uh, to build the tank. Um, you know, I, I believe that um, uh, we uh, are close to getting 100% uh, support from the neighbors in uh, Felton Heights. Uh, if we can uh, work with uh, John Erickson on this alternative site, the south site. Um, uh, our next step will be to uh, the president of the Road Association and myself to reach out to John Erickson, um, showing the support of the, the neighborhood and start, hopefully we can work with John back on track to negotiate uh, a location to place the tank. But I think it was a good meeting. And by the time we were done, we did have, uh, I think just about everybody in the room and on uh, Zoom in support of the project, as long as we could work with John. Yeah. And um, I, I do want to thank um, um, Josh and Carly and our IT guy, Scott, for also coming to the meeting. And I thought um, that Carly and Josh did a really good job explaining things you could, when they would explain things, you could just sort of see the emotional temperature in the room dropping, you know, and so um, I, I think that they, and Rick did a great job of extract, extracting uh, agreement from the two major protagonists, um, in the, you know, and getting them to say it publicly. So I, I thought it was, a, it was a tough meeting in some ways, but in the end it was, it was successful. Okay. Just one little last comment on that. You know, um, uh, Director Fultz, you've been a big supporter of this. The Felton Library has a wonderful meeting room. Um, we were uh, successful with getting a, a hybrid meeting, uh, and the folks were very pleasurable to work with down at uh, the Felton Library. Good. That's really that's really great to hear, Rick. And I'm I'm glad you were able to do a hybrid meeting. That is the that is the future. We had some issues, but. No, I know, I know. First out. time is tough. First time is tough, but, <laughs> yeah. but it's the future. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, are there any questions or comments 
about uh, department status reports or committee reports from members of the board? Um, Mark. Yes, a um, couple on the engineering department report. On page 52, uh, where we address uh, Breck and Bray and Forest Springs, um, have we received any invoices from Sandus for their part of the work on this? And if so, have those invoices been appropriately submitted to DWR for reimbursement so that we could start that reimbursement process? We have not actually received invoices from them yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so they're, what, uh, 10, 10 months out in doing work? And, okay. Nope. Okay. Um, on page 53 of the engineering department report, uh, the GIS system updates. Um, you mentioned uh, more time-sensitive projects that uh, the GIS person is involved in. I'm just curious, you know, briefly, what are those more important projects? That... So, uh, minor clarification, our GIS guy is uh, Weston. He is a GIS and CAD specialist. I have had use for him on several projects which were of shorter duration where we mm -hmm. would have another agency or a ratepayer asking for some specific piece of information. And I would pull him out of the field for a day or two to create the necessary exhibits utilizing either GIS or CAD. Good. Um, somebody that can uh, multitask and perform different functions for us. That's great. He um, has been I, a godsend. Good. Um, and I see that the Quail Hollow project is complete? It Yay! is. It is, it is just shy of complete. All of the work um, is done. Oh. We have scheduled the final paving walk with the county. Once the county has walked the site and agreed right. that it is complete, then I will be willing to say that it is complete. Okay. All right. And I have one brief question on the environmental department report. Uh, it references on page 55, uh, an application for the Big Basin Water Company as part of the state revolving fund. What's that? So that's the state revolving fund money that we're pursuing um, to bring on Big Basin Water Company into the district as part of our consolidation. Right now, we're just looking at a planning effort. So we're hoping to, to approach the state, ask for the money to go after the planning and the design and engineering. Uh, Susan Robinson, our grant contractor, and myself are working on that right now. It's a pretty large application package. Um, there's environmental, there's engineering, there's financial, there's quite a few pieces to it. So we're hoping to have that and bring it to the board in the future or very near future, probably by, I would say mid-January, we'll be ready to bring that to the board. Okay, thank you. That's, that's the 3.5 million, I do believe. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank uh, you. That's it. Bob? And, and on that grant application, you're putting in inflation adjusted numbers, right? Right, I believe that's what Sandus has provided us as okay. well. And du double whatever it is on the inflation assumption. Um, I, I only had one uh, quick question, and that is, will the um, operations report on water sources show us using any surface water in November? Not from Lion Plant, but from Kirby, yes. Do we expect we'll be using surface water from Lion shortly? We're gonna evaluate that on Monday after these next after this weekend storms. Great, thank you. Okay, um, any questions? Oh, go ahead, Jeff. Quick question for Rick: um, Where do we stand on the peer review for the uh, CZU fire rebuild? I, I do believe uh, we do have a draft peer review in, and um, it will be going to the December 
I'm pretty sure it's going plan to go to the, the December engineering committee to be reviewed and then to the board at the uh, uh, following meeting after engineering. We're very close to getting it to all of you. Good. Thank you. Uh, Mark, if you want to uh, answer anything or add to that. Um, district staff between Rick and Josh asked me to do a preliminary review on the very draft report um, that uh, the engineering firm provided to us. I did that, had some significant uh, formatting changes on how they were presenting it to us um, so that it could go in front of the engineering committee at our next meeting. Okay, thank you. Bob? Well, I'm also a member of the engineering committee as well, and I don't recall that I saw that. Um, so I'm curious, do we sort of give different information to different folks? No. As we reached out to, to Mark as the chair to the engineering committee to see how he wanted to proceed, if he wanted uh, to bring that on the, the next agenda. Um, and that's the reason we just went to Mark. There was no reason to bypass you, but we went to Mark as chair. Well, it sounds like it was a little more than do we want to put it on the next uh, agenda. You know, when I was chair of committees, I, I don't recall getting that kind of review capability on items, Rick. Um, I think we, as a board, when it comes time to review board policy, may need to review this a little bit closer. I have no problem with um, board members providing input in that way, but I think it needs to be even handed uh, across the board. I, you know, I do contact chairs of all committees and work on setting agendas and that, and I don't routinely reach out to the actual committee members um, but that's something, Bob, obviously. A, 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 agenda setting is fine, Rick. It's But this was not just, a, hey, do you want it on the next agenda like we used to have conversations about. This was actually an in-depth, detailed review of material. I, I, this, is, this is something that the board needs to address. Again, not a problem if we want to bring board members in to do that level of work. But I have expertise in finance. Um, and while I'm not in the finance committee any longer, I, when I was chair in that, I, I was not part of those kind of conversations. Okay. Your point's taken, Bob. Is, I, I forgot now if I went out to uh, members of the public to see if they had any comments or questions on department status reports or committee reports. So I'll just do it once more because I can't remember. No, I don't see any. Okay. Um, that brings us to uh, the written communications. So there was a, um, a number of uh, letters to the board regarding uh, Lake Lompico. Um, uh, do, I guess I would just simply say that uh, following on from uh, the statement that uh, Jenny Gomez made at the uh, oral communications, um, Rich and I, uh, Rich, uh, Rick uh, reached out and made an appointment with uh, J.M. Brown, um, who is the uh, assistant to Bruce McPherson. Um, and um, we met with him um, and basically made the point that this was Lake Long Pico being on uh, district on county property was it was their responsibility to deal with it and that we were quite willing to work with the county um, to potentially provide a uh, an electrical drop um, if uh, in a place uh, to put a you know some kind of shelter for a pump if uh, uh, the county would hold us uh, harmless on this and basically uh, that where it has gone, JM said he would look into it and he would get back to Jenny Gomez. And um, the other thing I would simply say is that Jenny Gomez has not asked to uh, agendize this topic I offered at the meeting and she has not contacted me to do that. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, she has re uh, removed her grant application um, for uh, the aeration system. And just to clarify, when we met with J.M. Brown, 
we talked about the district may be willing to work with them on uh, placing something on district property that wasn't interested in assuming any of the operational costs. And I'm probably going to get Gina here. <laughs> I was just going to suggest, Chair Mayhood, limiting the discussion on this since it's just, you know, agenda yeah. is just informational items and not as an item of board discussion. No, I, I, yeah, okay. I, that's what I, I, that's what I was trying to do. So, but Bob, if you have a quick comment, it's okay. Yeah, my comment was, uh, it seems like it's worthy of being agendized. <laughs> so, but if she's, if she's withdrawn the grant application and it's moot, then perhaps um, we don't need to agendize it. So, uh, but but if it does come back, I do think it needs to be an no, uh, Well, if, if she had made the request, we would have done it, but we've had no requests from her or any other people. Well, well I could make the request that it be yes, agendized, sir. right? But if the grant application has been withdrawn, there's there's no reason to move forward because the project won't happen anyway. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, no informational material. So that basically brings us to the end of open session. Um, and so, Gina, how do you want to um, handle uh, whether we need to come back to open session? I think what I want to simply say is that although we will reconvene in closed session, there will be no decisions that will be need needed there will be no actions taken so that there's no need to come back and uh, report actions in open session. Yeah, I, I, I agree. There's no like, there's no likelihood of any actions being taken. Um, so we can represent that there won't be any report out here on the record. Um, and I can provide the time of adjournment. Um, when we adjourn the, the close from the closed session, I can provide that to the Holly for the minutes. Okay. Um, how about if we take a 10 minute break um, so that because this has been kind of a long session and take a 10 minute break. So we'll come back at 840 um, to start closed session. But Holly's got a question. Uh, CTV, do they need to hang around for the as long as no, you're that, in? That was our point. Our point was they don't need to hang around. And neither do you. Holly. OK. All <laughs> right. I just wanted to make sure Brian understood that. Thank you. Yeah. OK. That, that's what we were trying to accomplish is that you guys were off the hook. All right. So uh, everybody come back for the, the closed session at 840. Thank you. Thank you.